Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Chris Austin. I'm the pastor of our 528 campus. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we are so glad you joined us here to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. So when we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together, praying together, serving together are all things that just, they don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find information about our locations, service times, and much more. We hope to see you soon. In Japan, there's this famous story about a dog named Hachiko. He was born in 1923, and his owner was a professor, a guy named Ueno. And he would take Hachiko to the train station. They lived outside of Tokyo, uh, where uh, Ueno commuted in. But he would take Hachiko to the train station. They'd just hang out <clears throat> and wait till he boarded the, pl- uh, boarded the train. And then he would not go home. He would just stay around at the station. He'd befriend people. Uh, people that like worked around the station would give him treats. He'd walk up to passengers, all this kind of stuff. So he kind of became this like beloved mascot of the train station. But he was there because he was waiting faithfully for his master Ueno to come home from work. Uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, come home from work and get off the train where he would just wait by the train, and they would walk home together. And he did it for years. And then there was a day where he took. Uh, or I say he took, Ueno took him to the train station, and Ueno got on board, and Hachiko waited for him there, and Ueno didn't come back. And unfortunately, he had died suddenly. And so Hachiko just waited there, and then when he realized he didn't, he didn't come back, uh, he finally went home, and the next day he came back at the same time that the train usually returned from Tokyo. And Hachiko did that for nine years, every day for nine years until Hachiko died. And during his lifetime, uh, and almost 90 years since, Hachiko has been celebrated in Japan. In fact, uh, as you see here, there are statues of Hachiko all over Japan. Uh, Not to weird you out, but on the top right-hand corner, they even taxidermied and stuffed him. Uh, And people come from all over to pay homage to Hachiko. He's on the sides of buses. That's a little Hachiko icon right there, that middle one all over the place. And it's uh, the, the reason that he's been like books, and there's even a movie about him, and he has been inspired, or rather, I should say, the Japanese, and, and frankly, people around the world that hear his story have been inspired simply because of his devotion. It's these kind of stories that, that they kind of, they just work on our hearts, because there's something beautifully powerful about devotion. Think about it, for example, in a series called Marriage Matters. Think about what happens in your marriage. <clears throat> You hear of people that have been married 50 years or 60 years or even 70 years. And it's when you hear those kind of things, and you, especially when you see those couples that are at that point usually bespeckled and aged and a little bit of wrinkles, gravity's kind of done its work, but they're still together, kind of holding hands. It's that tilt your head and go, oh, I mean, that's just, just, it hits you here. There's something about something about devotion. It's the kind of devotion that we, we, we have implicit in when we stand before uh, a pastor, and you're getting married, right? And you're doing the vows, like, I'm going to love you and cherish you and comfort you and keep you all the days of my life, forsaking all others, uh, devoted only to you till death do us part as long as I shall live. And I, I, I love that vow. I've done many a wedding. But what if I were to tell you, like, that vow is kind of true, and it's kind of not true. Now, I know you're like, what do you mean it's kind of not true, Yancey? Didn't you remember, like, Danny Zuko singing to Sandy, like, hopelessly devoted, you know, all that kind of stuff in Greece? And I would still say I'm standing by what I believe. Just for the record, uh, Danny and uh, Sandy didn't even last till Greece too. There's a whole different couple, so there you go. <clears throat> I would argue this. If you want a marriage that matters, um, you're going to need to understand the power of devotion in light of how God sees not just only devotion but marriage. And I'm, I'm going to argue maybe the best way Maybe the best way to impact your marriage actually impacts your devotion in that marriage. And so where am I getting all this stuff? Listen, if you'll turn with me in your own copies of Scripture, whether you, whether you have it in book form or on your smartphone, 
get a Bible app. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, we've already been in 1 Corinthians. I think Chris probably was in, Chris, were you in Corinthians? Okay, so he was in Corinthians last week, <clears throat> last Sunday. We're going to stay back in Corinthians, but if you weren't here last Sunday, let me kind of catch you up with the historical situation going on, because it really helps us understand this passage. So Corinth was, we, we kind of joke, it's the Las Vegas of the ancient Near East. It was just a, a wild place, a very pagan place. When I say pagan, I don't mean they were irreligious, though many of them were. I mean that they had all kinds of gods and temples to gods, like Artemis or Apollo or Athena or Aphrodite. Apparently, all they had to start off with his name with the letter A. But, but they, Corinth was a place where you went to make a buck, really not to raise a family, but they did have this high religion with all these different little temples in there. So here's what I want you to imagine. This is, a, this is a town on the coast of Greece. Paul shows up with his church planting team. You know, we're talking about Acts 29. Well, they, they, were, they were in the middle between Acts 1 and Acts 28. They're, they're actually going in. You can read about them. They're going to Corinth. And they're the, they're the earliest Christian presence there, and they're sharing the gospel. And so just imagine there's some people in Corinth that become Christians. They've been pagans their whole life. And again, I don't necessarily mean irreligious. They might have been religious for all other kinds of gods. They come to know God through the person of Jesus Christ, and now they've become Christians. And Paul and his team are trying to disciple these men and women into what does it look like to follow Jesus. So your whole world's changed, right? And, and part of the things that you need to do, one of the things he's teaching them... <clears throat> is that you have to separate yourself from the corruption of the world. Like God's made you a new people. Uh, you're holy and sanctified and separate unto God. You need to be very careful about how you engage the world so that you don't, you don't fall back into its, its values and its, uh, its decisions and all the other things that this fallen world can do. And so that's going to be hard for you, Corinthians, because this is all you've ever known. And so it was hard. Like their friends, they go to work, all their friends are pagans. Uh, they, they go to play, all their friends are, I mean, their coworkers are pagans, their friends are pagans. Here's even the harder part. Their family are pagans, and especially even this. You've got some people who are like, no, I, Paul, this is really hard. Like, my spouse is a pagan. Like, I became a Christian, my spouse didn't. And you've been talking about how we're supposed to separate ourselves at some level from like the worldly corruption where it'll defile us. So my, my question here, Apostle Paul, is... Um, is my marriage corrupted? Is my marriage defiled because I'm married to someone who's not a follower of Jesus? Do I need to like bail? Do I need to get a divorce? That's the question that Paul's dealing with in 1 Corinthians 7 verses 12, let's see, through 16. Now here's what I want to do. I want us to look at how Paul specifically answers that question. Because in that specific situation, he'll give a specific answer, but he also brings kind of a, a general truth that applies to anyone who is married or wants to be married. In fact, it may be a general truth we all should just know, period. What is it? Let's, let's just jump in. All right, so someone's raised a question and said, Paul, listen, I'm, I'm, my, my, my wife's an unbeliever, my, my husband's an unbeliever, and what, I guess we should get divorced because he's going to defile me or she's going to defile me. Notice what he says here, verse 12. <clears throat> Excuse me, here we go. Uh, to the rest, I say. Now, the reason I, he says the rest, he's talked to like married folk that, that, have, you know, that don't have any issues. He's talked to single folk. He's talked to widows. Now he's talking to people that what I would say is in mixed marriages. Now, mixed marriage kind of has a, you can say all kinds of things to Americans. You could talk about, are you talking about like they're ethnically mixed or they're racially mixed? No. When we talk about mixed marriages in the Bible, we're talking about they're spiritually mixed. So again, a Christian with an unchristian, a non-Christian. So to those folks I say, and notice what he says, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. Verse 13. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Now, let me, that first line, I've got to talk, the teacher in me just has to stop and talk about this because a lot of people might misunderstand. When Paul's like says, hey, listen, I'm saying this, not Jesus. He's not saying like, you know what, I'm just going to pull some kind of opinion out of my backside. I'm just going to make something up. That's not what he's saying. He's simply saying like this specific issue of whether when you have a believer married to an unbeliever, that someone's been converted in a marriage and now it's a mixed marriage. Uh, Jesus never addressed that. That's all Paul's trying to say. In his ministry, you don't Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you never see Jesus talk about that. So that's all Paul's saying. He's going to give the apostolic authority uh, that he needs to here. And what he clearly says here is this. If you're in a marriage and you become a Christian, right, and your spouse doesn't, 
as long as your spouse is willing to stay with you, don't divorce them. You're not free to divorce your unbelieving spouse. That's what, that's what Paul says here. Now, some of them might go, okay, well, why is he making such a big deal about this? This is, this is even in the Scripture. And, and that would be a good question to ask because there are a lot of reasons that this is way more complex than people might think. So when you become a follower of Jesus, by the way, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm so grateful that you're here at Clear Creek. We hope this can be a really good place for you to, to journey with us to, to, to figure more about like if you want to become a follower of Christ or not. But when you should probably know this, when you become when someone becomes a follower of Jesus, their whole world changes because their whole in, their, their whole interior world has changed. They have a they've got a new Lord, they have a new master. They have a new way to see life. They have a new value system. They even have a new decision tree. Like, do I do this? Does it honor God? Yes or no? I mean, they, they have different values and factors that they didn't have when they were not Christians. And all of those things have been shaped and tutored by Jesus Christ and the work at the cross and the empty tomb, what we'd say the gospel. Now, that alone, that, that change in ecosystem, if you will, alone can really impact the status quo in a marriage. I mean, I mean big time. Let me give you kind of an analogy. Imagine, like, I don't know, how many of you ever bought a pet fish, like, when you were little? Anyone ever? Okay. <clears throat> Remember when you went to the pet store and you bought that fish and they gave you that, you know, that little fish, they put it in a baggie, and they said, what, what did they say for you to do when you got back to your tank back home? You take that baggie and you do what? You set it in the water. You don't dump the fish out directly into the water. Why? Because it'll what? <clears throat> it'll shock the fish. And you may, you may well kill that fish. You've got to let that fish acclimate uh, in the bag so that whatever, that whatever that ecosystem of the water is, uh, it's got to balance itself out. Because if you don't, you can kill that fish. Now, that's somewhat analogous to what Paul's dealing with. When, when you're in a marriage, right, and you're both non-Christians, and somehow you became a Christian, all of a sudden you have a different ecosystem. That your, that your spouse, husband or wife, did not sign up for. But it's such a different ecosystem that it can be a, a spiritual shock to them. I mean, it, it can be ruinous to them. Now, let me, let me, let me kind of amp up here. Um, think of it this way. In the Greco-Roman world, in the world of the Bible, in the world of at least Corinthians, <clears throat> in, the, in the home, they observed a, a rule called the potter Familius. If you're a West Texan like I am, maybe the Potter Familius. But um, <clears throat> the Potter Familius, which meant this: the oldest living male in the home, which almost invariably was the was the husband, he was the ruler of the home. He was the lord. He was the master. He was the one to whom was given all devotion by the family members. Now, again, in a Greco-Roman family, it could be. Uh, the spouse, the kids, the workers, the slaves, everybody. That's how it was in the first century. And you did whatever the, the, the husband did. Now that included religion. So when, whatever religion, whatever the ancestral God was of the family clan, everybody in the household had to observe that God or gods. So let's just go with the illustration here. If the husband served Apollo then the wife better serve Apollo, and the kids better serve Apollo. Like, that's the kind of devotion you had to have toward your spouse, namely to your husband, that whatever your husband did, you were devoted to him completely, even in religion. Now, do you see how problematic this would be at Corinth? I'll, I'll paint the picture. So at Corinth Community Church a thousand years, 2,000 years ago, and the women in Corinth Community Church try to do this women's event called Steadfast, Right? And they have this lady up there that's like Jenna Craft, who spoke at our last... So Jenna Craft, the Corinthian Jenna Craft, <clears throat> gets up there and she starts speaking about Jesus. And all of a sudden, uh, there's a lady that came because her Christian friends brought her because they worked down at the Corinthian bank. I have no idea. So <clears throat> they brought her on their, on their arm and all of a sudden, she hears Corinthian Jenna talk about Jesus and this Corinthian lady's like... I'm in, man. Like, I, I'm going to become a follower. of. I believe there is a, uh, there's only one God, and you can only know him through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, now that woman walks out of Corinth Community Church. She's got a new devotion. I mean, she's, she's got a new God, a new master. A new, in other words, she got, she's the fish, got put in a whole different set of water, right? Now, who's the first conflict she's going to have with? 
She's going to be with her husband. She's going to walk in the door wherever they live, right? She's going to walk in the door, and she's like, uh, I, I got a new God. What do, you, what do you mean you got a new God? Yeah, I got a new God, and it's not, it's not Apollo, and it's not Aphrodite, and it's, it's not Artemis. Well, who is it? Well, it's this guy named Jesus. A guy named Jesus? Well, he's, he's, he's God and man, and he, he's the Messiah, uh, okay, well, let's just, uh, maybe we can add him in. No, you can't add him in. He's, he's the one true God. Well, hold on. Are you telling me? Now, now do you see the tension that happens? See, what, what, what you may need to understand also as well is that if you disobeyed the potter familius, uh, you, you did so maybe at the risk of the pain of death. So, so you could abuse your spouse. You could neglect your spouse. You could abandon your spouse. Or you could kill your spouse. Or your children, for that matter. If you disobeyed the potter familius. That's how they ran in the Greco-Roman world. Paul knows the stakes are high. So he's like, oh my gosh. So we, we have, for example, women who are coming here to our church services, and they're getting saved, right? And now they've got to go back into a home and maybe, maybe even risk their own lives. That's what's at stake here, right? And so Paul's like, uh, what do I tell these women? Like, what's, what, what does God want me to tell them? Because they're saying, do I need to leave my home? And here's what Paul says. Paul says, listen, if you're in a marriage and you become a Christian and your husband and or wife, or wife, I should say, does not, then as long as they're willing to stay with you, you stay in that marriage. Now, here's what he does. In the next couple of verses, uh, 14, 15, and 16, he gives us the why. He's like, here's why I'm asking you to stay. In fact, he's not even asking. Here's why I'm commanding you to stay. You're not free to divorce them. Well, I hope it's a pretty good reason. And the reason he gives doesn't just apply to people in mixed marriages. It applies to us in all marriages. And this is why we're preaching this, why we're looking at this text today. So look with me in verse 14. <clears throat> For the unbelief... So why would you stay? Why, would, why is Paul commanding them to stay and not... Oh, so here's the deal. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to what? Now you know why it says peace, y'all. Because these, these people could die. Some of them could. Or they could at least be abused or neglected. He says, but God has called you to peace. For how do you know? Now notice how he speaks to both husband and wife that are the believers in a, a mixed marriage. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you, whether you will save your wife? Now, we'll just stop here. Leave this on the screen just for a second. <clears throat> this, this could be very... Um, this, this, this can be an easily misunderstood passage because it makes it sound like here, like what's all this talk about the, the, the believing husband can make clean his wife or children or make him holy. It's like if you, if you read it really quickly and, and not in the context of the rest of the scripture, you would think, is this saying that, that, that the believing spouse saves like the household? That's not what Paul's saying. In fact, he can't say that because he said the opposite in about a zillion other passages. That, that, that the only reason anyone gets converted and becomes a Christian is when they are, are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So there's, there's nothing like that you can do as a spouse that's going to have some salvific power to it. Like, oh my gosh, it's all up to me to save them and be saved. And that's not, that's not I wish it were that easy, but it's not that easy. In fact, that's not what this text here, says here at all. So we know he, he cannot be saying that. So what is he, what's he saying? Here's, here's what he's saying. He's saying that when you're the only person in your family, and again, the context here is marriage, when you're, when you're the only believing spouse, you're the only person in your household that's a Christian, you have incredible influence. Like you have such, you, like you have a holy, sanctifying influence, that you have a positive impact in the spiritual trajectory of your spouse, and not just your spouse, but your kids. That's why Paul says, the reason I want you to stay there, the reason I think the Lord commands us to stay there, if it, if, if it, if at the risk of, uh, since, since, uh, since there's peace, and you know, that, they, that he and or she, or she, whoever the unbelieving spouse is, they're willing to let you stay in that marriage and believe in Jesus, you got a chance to really, you can, you, you can, you can influence them for the gospel. Now here's why Paul says this, and here's what I want you to listen to me about. It's because marriage is a force multiplier. Now, I'm trying to speak to the engineers in the room. 
some of you NASA people, right? I, didn't, I forgot my slide ruler and my chart, but I have this. How many of you know or are familiar with the term force multiplier? Okay. So for, a force multiplier, just to make it very simple, it's something that's created, something that you design, it's a contraption, whatever it is, that allows you to um, exponentially enhance whatever force you put into it or whatever effort you put into it. The, the, you, you, can, you can accomplish more uh, because of this force multiplier. It multiplies basically the power that you put into it. I'll give you an example because I know that sounds weird. So uh, imagine, imagine this stool is kind of like a 50-pound rock. Now, some of us in this room, man, if we really just got in here, we could lift maybe that 50-pound rock just a little bit. But if you had a lever, right? If you had a lever, like you, 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 got, like, you put a little fulcrum, like a little stone right here, and then you put like a, a six-foot board, and you put that board on top of the stone underneath the rock, I could push down. I know some of you are like already geeking out. I mean, like, well, technically, Nancy, you'd have to be a nine-foot this. Huh? We get it. 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 Just go with the illustration. So just imagine, right, like you, you put in less the kind of force into it, right, with load. and I, You put the less type of effort into it, and all of a sudden you cannot just lift up a 50-pound rock. You can lift up a 250-pound rock. It's because that contraption is multiplying. It's a, it's a force multiplier. The reason Paul says what he says to these men and women that are in mixed marriages, that, that, that started off as similar marriages, they were, they were unified marriages, but someone just got saved, is that he's telling them, stay there because marriage is a force multiplier. Whatever happens in that marriage, that you bring into that marriage is amplified. It's, 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 it, it's, it's, there's some exponential, the force of that is multiplied. Because it's the most, and I, I think you could make a very good case for this. It's one of, but I, I'm going to argue that it's the most. It is the most intense relational circle that God's created between a husband and a wife. Now, what about kids? Kids are good. They're, 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 that's a close relationship, too. But I'm telling you, when you look at the Scriptures, as close as kids and parents are, the Bible says husbands and wives are to be closer. Like, I love my kids, but I tell my kids, listen, if it's between you guys and my wife, I'll see you guys later. I'm sticking with Jen. I can have more of y'all if I have to. So let's just, <clears throat> that's probably not the most biblical way to do it, but we get to the same point. So what I'm trying, to, I'm trying to share with you guys, like, that's why Paul is telling this woman or man, these Christians at Corinth Community Church, why it's such a big deal to stay in your marriage. Yeah, you didn't sign up for that. He didn't or she didn't either, but one of you got saved. And if the other spouse is willing to stay with you, stay with them because marriage is a force multiplier. It's this intense, intimate relationship that what happens there, it just stays longer, sticks deeper, happens more fast. I mean, it just, that's what force multiplying does. And so what he says here is like, listen, you're going to be the missionary to your marriage. And you're going to be more influential than anybody else, so influential that you... There's a sense that you make them holy. You don't save them, but you bring such a holy influence. Like Your, your kids and your spouse are going to have a shot to come to Jesus better than anything else. In fact, you can drag your kids and your spouse to church services, and it won't be nearly as powerful as you living out the gospel as a missionary in your own marriage. What? So, so what's, the, what's the principle that we see Paul really addressing here? Here's the principle, and it goes for everybody when it comes to Marriage and devotion. We'll put it on the screen for you. It says this. It says that you're most devoted to, you're most devoted to your spouse when you're more devoted to Jesus. I'm just going to let that sit for a little bit. Right? be a good thing to memorize in your own heart. Speaking about marriage, I told you, marriage is it's when we say I'm totally devoted to my spouse. When we get married, kind of true, kind of not true. Here's why. You're most devoted to your spouse. Don't you want to be devoted to your spouse? Of course you do. You're most devoted to your spouse when you're more devoted to Jesus. That, that's what Paul's trying to say here. It's true that in a Christian wedding, I've done a few of them, it's true in a Christian wedding, you got a pastor up here, you got a, a bride and a groom, and they, they pledge their devotion to each other. But you know, in a Christian marriage, what makes it a Christian wedding and marriage is they pledge their devotion to each other in light of a greater devotion. It's going to sound really weird, um, but like, I think Christian marriage is it's never between two people. There are three people in a Christian marriage. And it's like, well, that sounds kind of weird. No, no, there's three people in a Christian marriage. There's a husband and a wife and a Lord over them both. That's how that works. Like when, when you get married and you put that ring 
For those of you who are married, you're wearing a ring on your finger because culturally we do that. That ring is a, that's a covenant symbol. You know, I bet you don't use the word covenant very much. You know why? Because it's a religious word. It's a spiritual word. It's a word that we see rooted really in the Old Testament and New Testament. It's a Bible word because it has to do with God. So, so like when, when I put uh, Jennifer's wedding ring on, by the way, my wife's name is Jennifer. It wasn't a random person. So when I, when I married Jennifer, we, we were married, she put this ring on my finger. We were not just covenanting with each other. The reason it was even a covenant is because we were making a promise to each other and to God. When I look at my wedding ring, I don't just think how awesome my wife is. I think I'm, I'm committed to God first. And what's ironic is the more I'm committed to God and more devoted to him in Christ, the better it is for my spouse because you're most devoted to your spouse when you're more devoted to Jesus, period. And listen, I get it. I know that it's tough. I, I know that things can be hard, especially when you have a spouse. But Yancey, what about my spouse? He says he's a Christian, but he's really a Christian in name only. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And here's what Paul would tell you. Here's what the Spirit would say through the Scriptures that he said through Paul. Stay in there and be a missionary. Love your spouse. Love your kids. Follow Jesus first. Well, what, 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 if, I, what, what if I has a hard time between, like, um, you know, do I follow my spouse or do I follow Jesus? Listen, uh, Jesus is going to be the only other man you should ever have in your marriage. That's the only other man. And he's not just a man, he happens to be the Lord of all. And so, so like the, the, what you want more than anything is like, listen, i got to follow Jesus more than anything else. And all Paul's trying to say is if you can follow Jesus and stay in your... So if your unbelieving spouse won't abandon you, because that's what happened to most Greco-Roman worlds, they'd be like, uh, families, they'd be like, well, I'm, I'm going to cast you out and just let you try to live somewhere on the streets. And Paul's like, Ben, if they won't do that, if they won't abandon you, you don't abandon them because you have the life-giving truth pulsing in you. You know what it's like to be in a different ecosystem, and you're bringing that ecosystem into this marriage, into this family. And the most intense way you can do that is that force multiplier of being in the marital bonds. Listen, man, you're most devoted to your spouse when you're more devoted to Jesus. I tell you how that's come to bear for me, where that struck me early on. <clears throat> when I was, uh, I'll tell you about my first date with Jennifer. Um, minus all the face sucking and uh, no, I didn't. We didn't, we, didn't. <clears throat> we didn't do that on the first date. Second date we did. No, I'm just. <laughs> so I had dated a girl. I had a girlfriend uh, just right before Jennifer, and she's a wonderful person. We were still good friends today. Fantastic, uh, beautiful girl, tall, athletic, all these kind of things that I'd kind of grown up with in some prior relationships that I'd been in. I came from an athletic family. I was always around sports stuff. She was a sports girl. Like, oh, this is perfect. And, um, and then uh, what, what probably, I don't want to say sat, the reason, one of the reasons our relationship didn't work out um, and was because I always felt like she deferred to me. I always felt like, yep, you know, whatever you say is right. And she didn't say that, but that's kind of how it felt to me. And I just didn't like that because I'm, I'm definitely not a perfect person. I have my own issues. And, and I, I wanted someone to push on me a little bit more than she did. And uh, it, it just wasn't meant to be, you know. Again, still good friends with her today. She's married to a friend of mine. They're fantastic. And then I, I ran across this girl named Jennifer Lang. And she's not, uh, I mean, she's blonde hair and kind of green eyes, but she's like, she's this tall. I had to put her up on the, on the chair when we ate to eat together, and she's not an athlete. She can't even spell athlete. <laughs> Tried to get her to play like right field in a softball game because we were, were going to forfeit because we, we, we didn't have a person there. This kind of a co-ed church league. And I told her, I was like, listen, uh, Jennifer, you can just sit and pick grass. We don't care if the ball's, we just don't want to forfeit. She's like, nope. I'm like, man, this is going to be a hard one. This is going to be... But our first date, I, uh, I, I lived with two other guys in a house uh, in Garland, Texas, which is close to where my church was. <clears throat> um, and so Jennifer and I, I think we went somewhere to eat. We didn't go to a movie. I know we didn't go to a movie because I, don't, I, don't, I think movies are the worst dates to go on because you never talk to anybody. Now, if you don't like that person, it's a perfect date. <laughs> but we, 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 went to, we did something, and then we came to my house and we never even went in. My roommates were watching a movie. They're just hanging out, and, and Jennifer knew them. But we, we just stayed in the garage and literally just turned the car off, and we just got in this real deep conversation. We spoke for like three or four hours, and it went to like two in the morning. 
And she went home after that. And later in that week, I got a card from her. And so one of my roommates was a guy named Joey. Uh, used to used to serve on staff here at this church many, many years ago. And Joey's like, Yancey, you got, you got a note from Jennifer. I'm like, oh, come on, man, note from Jennifer, let's go. So I got that note, opened it up, see if there's any perfume she sprayed in there. I don't know why I thought, like, we were in the 1940s, but I wanted to see if that's how they did that. And I open up this card, it's like, Yancey, had such a great time with you. I'm like, come on now, yeah, let's go. That's what I want to hear. That, uh, and so she starts saying all these great things, and then she's like, but. I'm like, oh, hey, why is that conjunction in this? It's not the conjunction. You don't want a but or however. So I got a but. I was like, but, uh, and then she just went on to share, like, I'm, I don't think it was wise. And she didn't even, she's like, I know you weren't thinking, I don't think it's wise that I got out of that place around two in the morning. Because the more I thought of it, when I got home, um, I, I got people that live around me, and I, they, they know that I'm kind of seeing you, and you're this pastor guy, but more importantly, you're a follower of Jesus, and I'm a follower of Jesus, and I, don't, I just don't want people just thinking things that weren't true, and I don't want to give any appearance of evil. And, I, and I'm like, I read that, and um, you, you might have thought it had taken the wind out of my cells. But, I mean, all I, when I read that, I just smiled and looked at Joey. I'm like, this girl's going to work. This one right here is going to, this, this is going to work. And here's, here's why I felt that way. Um, I felt like if I could finally found someone, find someone who loved Jesus more than they loved me, then they would love me well. I, I, I felt like if I could find a woman who was more devoted to Jesus than she would be to me, then she'd be devoted to me. Because the minute she's more devoted to me than Jesus, then she's selling both of us out. Can, I, can y'all feel me on that? Because that's the truth. Now listen, it, it's a hard deal if you're in a marriage where you, you're married to someone who's just a, spirit, a, a Christian in name only. I get it. I'm not even knocking you. It's hard. You, you're the heroic one. you got to live for Jesus. It's even more true, or even truer, if you're in a relationship where it's more, Corinth, it's more 1 Corinthians 7. Yancey, I got saved. My husband didn't get saved, or my wife didn't, and I'm, I'm in that. Listen, you're the hero, man. Just leverage the force multiplication that you can for the gospel. For the rest of you that are married to someone who happens to also be a believer in Jesus, I'm telling you, you want them to be devoted to you, they need to be more devoted to Jesus. You need to want to spur that on, want to encourage that, and better yet, you want to grow together. Like, if here's the Lord and here you two guys are. The closer you get to the Lord, the closer you get to you. And I'm just telling you, marriage is a force multiplier. People talk about tools of discipleship like, oh, it's the Bible and it's prayer and it's worship service together. Those are all true and they're necessary. I'm telling you, there's another club in the bag to help you grow in Jesus that no one thinks about. It's marriage. Right? Or in the words of Princess Bride, it's marriage. Right? That's what you want. Because it's a force multiplier. Praying with your spouse, reading the scriptures with your spouse, talking about Jesus with your spouse will impact you much more deeply than sometimes, maybe a lot of times, coming here and even getting in a small group. Because it's the most intimate, powerful, human relationship God gives us. This is why God talks about the church as the bride and he is the groom. Because that's how powerful. Marriage matters. It can matter in your own Marriage, when you're most devoted to your spouse, that's when you're more devoted to, excuse me, you're most devoted to your spouse when you're more devoted to Jesus. So listen, I want you to hear this from me. Um, (laughs) What's best in your marriage, ultimately, is not to hear a TED Talk on marriage, not to go to a marriage retreat or a marriage conference or read a book on marriage, and all those are good and I highly recommend them, but what's best for your marriage is that you follow Jesus together in that marriage. What's best for your marriage is to know and understand the scriptures. What's best in your marriage is to, is to pray and follow Jesus. What's best in your marriage is to maybe do small group together, worship services together. The best thing is to grow in Jesus. Because when you grow in your devotion to Jesus, I can tell you this, it'll grow your devotion to your spouse. Because now you love that person for the right reasons. More so for the right reasons. So that's the power of devotion in marriage, I, again, I, I don't want to. I don't want to assume anything. Um, I don't know. For some of you, it's like I just need to recommit to follow Jesus. Some of you are just fired up, going, "Ah, oh, I feel like I'm on the right road." Some of you just, Yancey, I feel really discouraged because I'm, I'm in a mixed marriage, and I, I just want to encourage you to say, just keep on keeping on, follow Jesus. Just remember that you have more than one family. You have a family that Jesus died for. It's called the church. We're your family too. In fact, Jesus says it's the more important family. Believe it or not. 
mean, he got called on the carpet, so to speak. It's like, Jesus, where are your mom and your brothers and your sisters? Because he had brothers and sisters. I know it's kind of a shock, but he did. And he's like, what, what brothers and sisters and mother do I have but those that do the will of God? So there's something powerful about devotion. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Because um, I, I, I would want to talk about this more. Here, here's what I would say. You strive to be devoted to Jesus, and you'll be devoted to your spouse. That's how you're best devoted to your spouse. And here's what will not happen, most likely. They will not build a statue of you. They won't rename a train station after you, and hopefully they don't stuff you with a taxidermist and put you in the house. (laughs) But you will leave a legacy that's much greater. And by the Lord's grace, you may leave a legacy that lasts generations, like the, the Lord may use that in His grace to not only bring your spouse to Jesus, but your kids to Jesus and your grandkids to Jesus. That's the power of devotion, because marriage matters. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the person and work of Jesus. I mean, the reason Paul can even tell these Corinthian Christians and us these truths is not just because marriage is a force multiplier. It's because you created it that way. Because ultimately, marriage is a picture that we learned in the first week. It's a picture of of Jesus to the church. A, a, A groom who has died for his bride to redeem his bride and make her holy. And Lord, I want to I want to just say, Lord, we just praise you. As you took a bunch of sinners and you went on a cross in the person of Jesus and you saved people and you're still saving people. And you're taking sinners and making them saints. And yet, Lord, you know there are some saints today that are in the same situation as it was in Corinth 2,000 years ago. They got saved in a marriage where the other spouse didn't. And so, Lord, I pray. First of all, we pray, Lord, that you'd save their spouse. That you would just, by the work of grace, change their hearts. And, Lord, that you would use... um, that saved husband or wife or maybe even child to do it. Lord, I want to pray for the marriages in here that are two believers and and maybe one's just kind of fallen flat. It's just easy to do, Lord. You know I've done it. They just just kind of stepped out of the gospel a little bit, not as devoted to you. Lord, I pray that you would rekindle their hearts, not just for their marriage, but more so for just loving Jesus. Somehow that will impact their marriage. Lord, I want to pray for my friends in this room that aren't married. That they, that they would not only know what devotion looks like in marriage, but they would just know that ultimately there's only one true groom, one true king, one true Lord, Lord over all who deserves all of our devotion. And when King Jesus has our ultimate devotions, all of our other loves get reordered correctly. It's the power of devotion. But it's got to be the power of devotion to the right person to whom deserves it all. And so, Lord, we're thankful for Jesus, thankful for this day. Lord, continue to work in us. We pray that marriage would matter. We know it does for you. May it do so for us, for your glory and for our good. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.